peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And Victor, if you come up here, I'll have a prayer with you and you can speak to us. Dear Heavenly Father, thanks for bringing Victor to us today, Father, and we're looking forward to what you're going to uh, what you're going to say to us through Victor. I ask it in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Got uh, PowerPoint for you today. I've preached in Port Angeles a number of times, often use PowerPoint there. And uh, I thought, well, you know, there might actually be somebody from Port Angeles too here. So I'm not going to preach a sermon that I preach there. <laughs> Lucky for Deborah. <laughs> and uh, let's see, yes, okay. Let's take a look at our first slide here, if I can get this to work. This works. We'll see. Looks for up. Oh, needs to be on, doesn't it? There we go. All right. What you're looking at there? Uh, you see a uh, church in the distance there. But the letter is 1945. It just happens to be the end of the war in the uh, European theater. Uh, Victory Day for. The Soviet Union was May 9th, I believe, in 1945. There you see a larger picture of this church. This is actually the Cathedral of the Russian Armed Forces, which is also <laughs> referred to as the Cathedral of the Resurrection of Christ. And uh, here in the foreground, you have a Russian saint, a saint of the Russian Orthodox Church, Prince Alexander Nevsky, who's standing guard with a drawn sword there in the foreground. This church was originally completed, yes, on Victory Day, 75, the 75th anniversary of Victory Day, and uh, dedicated uh, a month later. There you see part of the dedication of the church. And at the dedication of the church, of course, since this is dedicated to the Russian military, it was filled with military officers and soldiers and the like uh, all over the premises of this Christian church. And um, there, you'll see right there to the left is an icon next to Sergei Shoigu, who is the Minister of Defense for Russia, and that icon actually purports to be a miracle. And you thought the Roman Catholic Church was the only one that had miraculous imagery and the like. Well, this icon supposedly was presented to King Abgar V by the Savior himself and made by the Savior himself. It's actually called the icon of the Savior, not made by hands, interestingly enough. So here, of course, to add some sanctity to this great cathedral dedicated to the armed forces and to some extent warfare, uh, you have this miraculous icon. You know, it reminds me a lot of Constantine. <laughs> you remember, that's when things historically for Christianity really took a turn south, as they say, when uh, King Constantine, or Emperor Constantine, uh, the political opportunist, decided to, to use Christianity to advance his cause and claimed to have some miraculous appearance from the Savior himself, who told him to conquer in this sign, which was probably the first two letters of Christ in the Greek alphabet, they referred to as the labarum, Anyway, Constantine, also a man who uh, 
history tells us there's a good chance he actually murdered his own wife and his eldest son, um, and who, uh, uh, you know, uh, was an opportunist and um, used the Christian faith to advance his megalomaniac uh, plans. I'm thinking of uh, another ruler in Russia here, <laughs> similar, it seems, aspirations to take advantage of the Rus Russian Orthodox faith as the favored faith of Russia. There's Sergei, again, the Minister of Defense next to him in this mosaic that was originally placed there in the temple dedicated to Russian forces. And in the back, in the original mosaic, it actually had this banner with Stalin in it. And this became quite controversial uh, because you know the history of Stalin and uh, this mosaic was eventually either covered or removed from, from the church, but that was the original intent to also give some, some uh, recognition of Stalin, you know, who is the great dictator and tyrant responsible for the deaths of millions who kind of took the place of Hitler there in Berlin. Here's a huge picture erected right there in the wake of Victory Day in East Berlin, dedicated to Stalin. And uh, here I am at the what's left, the part of the Berlin Wall in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, that regime, world peace, world peace. There was a Gallup poll taken not too long ago about, about the top five questions that Americans would ask. And at the top of the list was, will there ever be world peace? Is there going to be world peace? And these are some of the answers that were given Yes, there'll be world peace only if all humans get lobotomized and finally merge into one hive mind. <laughs> yes, there'll be world peace. The only time there will be world peace is when mankind has been completely wiped off the face of the planet. Another answer was, yes, in a dream. Another person said, without wars and fighting and all the thrilling disasters happening every day, the world would be boring. And finally, somebody gave the right answer. Yes, there'll be world peace when the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, returns. And that really is the answer. There's much talk about civil war in our society today. I hear it all the time in the news waves, more so than I've ever heard it, even since the 60s, and I lived through the 60s. And... Um, this is a picture of Gettysburg with some of the dead who died there in the wake of the Civil War. If you weren't aware of it, more Americans died in the Civil War than both World War I and World War II combined. Almost more than all of the wars we have, just shy of all the wars we have ever had, the casualties we've ever had in all the wars in this Civil War. And... Uh, of course, there's been civil wars raging in Christian churches in this country for some time now, particularly in the mainline churches. Every one of them has been racked with civil war. And some people, of course, have been saying, well, the Adventist church is always kind of behind the curve, and so eventually maybe we'll have a civil war. But uh, I am currently has, have the privilege of preaching in a Presbyterian church once a month. Don't ask me how that happened, but it, it's happened, and I'll be preaching there next week, as a matter of fact. And what I found out was the Presbyterian Church of USA is actually the mainland church in the steepest decline of all of them, uh, resulting to a large extent from, of course, uh, the root problem, maybe higher criticism, lack of confidence in Scripture, but uh, civil war, civil war in their church. In Genesis chapter 6 it says, the earth was filled with violence. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled 
with violence. Since recorded history, there's only been 268 relatively war-free years, the longest of which was the Pax Romana for 100 years. And why was there the Pax Romana? Well, uh, because of the greatest war machine on earth up to that point. That's what ensured the Pax Romana, the warriors who worshiped the god of war. It's great human irony that peace is often brought about through the threat of violence. Many years ago, I took a course in the history of modern warfare. And uh, I was surprised to learn in this course that, that virtually all of the revolutions that have taken place historically, with the exception of the American Revolution, perhaps, always brought in a worse regime than they threw out. Of course, the classic case would be the French Revolution. Think about the horrors that came in as a result of that revolution. What do you think this fellow's holding in his hand right there? Any idea? Yeah. That just happens to be the plutonium core to the fat man bomb that devastated Nagasaki. And he's got a smile on his face, by the way. Yes, there is the fat man plut, the first plutonium bomb uh, dropped. It was more advanced than the bomb dropped on uh, Hiroshima. Interestingly enough, in that course, The History of Modern Warfare, there was a fellow in my class who purported to have been on the plane that dropped that bomb on Nagasaki. And he told us his story about how when it was dropped, they put the pedal to the metal to get out of there as fast as they could, but it wasn't quite fast enough. He said the shock wave that finally hit them, they were actually afraid they were going to get knocked out of the sky. Do you remember this? Those of you who grew up in the 50s? Yeah. Some elderly folk here like myself. Uh, yes, we had those drills in our elementary school classrooms. Oh, it's time for us to hide under our desks. Why? For fear of being bombed into oblivion with a nuclear weapon from the Soviets and uh, from the so-called commies, we used to call them. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I don't know how that would have helped, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's, what, that's, what we, that's what we did. Well, we know that war goes back a long way. It goes all the way back to the beginning. And in Revelation chapter 12, we read, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Civil war broke out in heaven, but it broke out first in the mind and heart of Lucifer. That's really where war started, in the mind and heart of the murderer, the one who was the murderer from the beginning. And he passed it on to our first parents. It began right from the start to engage in conflict, and then, of course, one of their sons murdered the other. Oh, my. Yes. Yes, the root of all our current conflicts originate in the civil war in man's heart. As long as sin rages there, there will be war. In Genesis chapter 6, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth, and at every inclination of the heart, thoughts of his heart, was only evil all the time. Yes, that's the root. Root of all evil, the root of all warfare and violence in the heart of humanity. World War II. There were upwards of 80 million casualties in that war. Many people have begun to forget World War II. Um, you know, from my era, we were brought up to kind of revere those who fought in that war, the great generation. And, um, but uh, then, of course, following in the wake of it, uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, we have become a race of intellectual giants and moral 
pygmies. Yes, one could proclaim that in the wake of World War II. Then, of course, you have communism that came in. Here's the killing fields, Pol Pot in Cambodia, communism, communist regimes. And some say it's hard, it's really difficult to put a, a figure on the actual casualties, but maybe upwards of 100, even to 150 million over a span of 100 years. In 1983, Psychology Today had a, uh, an article in which they asked some questions. Uh, they had a, a poll. And this was in the midst of the Cold War, 1983. You may remember it. That's the year I actually gave my heart to Jesus, December 30th, 1983. And at the ripe age of 30. Anyway, they asked the questions, if you could wipe out 100 million Soviets, would you do it with the push of a button? 15% of the American populace said yes. We would wipe out 100 million Soviets. Would you, if, if we had to sacrifice 25 to 50 million to solve the problem of the Cold World War, would you do it? 26% said yes. If you could secretly push a button and eliminate, eliminate one person without any repercussions, would you do it? 69% of men said yes. 59% of women said yes. 10% less. Uh, imagine that. If such a device could be invented, would there be any life left on Earth? And uh, the, the last person to push the button might, not, might end up hating himself and eliminate himself. Who knows? You know. Uh, there was a movie made, First Man, it was about the landing on the moon. And uh, yes, I, I was alive to see that too, as many here probably were too. And um, they landed uh, you know, in the sea of tranquility, you may remember. And Billy Graham, when he heard about them landing in the sea of tranquility, his response was, the only reason that sea was tranquil is because no man had ever been there before. And yes, yes, that's, that's the problem. The world's view of peace is different than God's view. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, Jesus said. The world's idea for, of, of peace is to first force your enemies to capitulate, force them to lay down their arms, and then you will have peace. And, you know, the disciples were known for that approach. They wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire and the Roman military. And they thought Jesus could do it through his divine power. And uh, that was the source to peace the way the world takes to, to peace. And today we have various movements trying to bring about peace, a utopia of sorts on the left and the right, the anti-fascist uh, wanting to bring about a utopia or a peace historically through completely wiping the slate clean to begin with, destroying the entire uh, society, and then out of the ashes, uh, birthing a communist utopia, and um, the Antifa having some of the roots in the, in the um, anarchists of Europe, historically. And, and you know, uh, but for the grace of God, I might be today, even at my advanced years, I might be out there marching with Antifa somewhere. I noticed uh, as I drove into town here, uh, I was greeted with a sign that said Reefer Den. <laughs> and I thought, we used to have those back in the 60s and 70s, but we didn't put up signs to advertise it. And uh, yes, that was me back then. That was me, as a matter of fact, in the year of the bicentennial, 1976. That was a John Lennon lookalike 
with a George Harrison T-shirt. And um, I had been seeking for peace in all the wrong places. I spent time in a Buddhist commune meditating three hours a day. And that didn't do the trick. And I ended up with marijuana psychosis. I was terribly paranoid hearing voices all the time. And I was probably demonically oppressed because I had had very close encounters uh, of the third kind uh, in, in the occult and had been exploring all the world's religions from astrology to Zen, or Zen to astrology, except for Christianity at the last when God plucked me like a brand out of the fire Amen. and led me to a knowledge of the gospel and of the truth. Well, on the far right, of course, we have also uh, historically an effort to bring about a utopia, in this case, a theocratic utopia, which some people think Marxism is a theocracy of sorts, a, a theological system without, of atheism, but in this case, uh, um, a uh, Christian theocracy. You'll notice a quote on the back of that man wearing a blue shirt, supposedly from George Washington, which actually is fake news. <laughs> George Washington never said that, but many of the quotes that are pawned off, you know, uh, in the effort uh, to build a theocracy are not true to portray uh, the U.S. as a, quote, Christian nation. No, um, uh, uh, Jefferson and Madison and the like, the greatest battle they had to fight was against the theocrats. Here's an interesting from, this is on his epitaph. He revered the Statute for Religious Freedom in Virginia along with the Declaration of Independence and had it inscribed on his epitaph. It says, where the preamble of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom declares that coercion is a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion, an amendment was proposed by inserting the words Jesus Christ so that it should read, a departure from the plan of Jesus Christ, the holy author of our religion. The insertion was rejected by a great majority in proof that they meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection the Jew and Gentile, the Christian and Mohammedan, the Hindu and infidel, even, of every denomination. Yes, that was the intent of our founding fathers. A letter to the Danbury Baptist, a famous letter here, uh, Dropping into the middle, I contemplate with sovereign reverence the act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and states. And that was the intent of Jefferson and the intent of the First Amendment, the intent in our Constitution, which makes no reference to God but does have a prohibition against any religious tests for public office. There I am in the National Archives in front of our great founding documents. And there I am in Independence Hall, where I grew up outside of Philadelphia in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, where if it wasn't for men like William Penn, great advocate of religious freedom, you would not have had, perhaps, the Constitution or the Declaration or the Bill of Rights. And here's the great monument to Thomas Jefferson. And many people are not aware, around the top of the rotunda, you'll see in bold there, statement, I have sworn upon the altar of God, eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. But the actual full context is the tyranny of, a th of the theocrats, the Christian theocrats, mostly Congregationalist at the time, or, or uh, Episcopalians, the clergy, he said, believe that any portion of power confided to me will be exerted in opposition to their schemes. And they believe rightly, for I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. And this, of course, is the way the devil operates in this great warfare between Christ and Satan. He wants to exercise tyranny over our minds and our wills. That's how he operates. There I am with Barry Black in front of a statue that had to be removed into a restricted area outside of the Senate chambers. I was able to get special permission.
to have him escort me back there to do some filming. I was filming a documentary on religious freedom and liberty. And uh, the reason it was moved is because the base of that statue is actually the most radioactive thing in the Capitol building. It's red marble, which actually emits more radiation than, than the EPA would allow for if you stood in front of it all day. And so people just pass through that hall all day and don't really get exposed that much to it. Roger Williams, one of the greatest heroes of American history, one of the most neglected of all of them, his statue even being relegated to a hall nobody stops at. It's not in the hall of statuary. And yet he stood up against the great theocratic tyranny of the Puritans in Massachusetts. who were stealing the land from the Native Americans and trying to forcibly convert them against their will. And in the middle of New England winter, he had to flee for his life into exile in what would become Rhode Island, 55 miles in deep snow with a case of pneumonia, leaving behind his pregnant wife. The Wampanoags sheltered him, and he would begin the first colony with full religious freedom from its charter. We read this, no person within the said colony at any time hereafter shall be any wise molested, punished, disquieted, or called into question for any differences in opinion in matters of religion who does not actually disturb the peace of our said colony, but that all and every person and persons may from time to time and at all times hereafter freely and fully have and enjoy his own and their judgments and consciences in matters of religious concernments throughout the tract of land heretofore mentioned, they behaving themselves peaceably and quietly and not using this liberty to licentious and profaneness, licentiousness and profaneness, not, nor to the civil injury or outward disturbance of others. And of course, other colonies would follow suit eventually and the US government as well. Here I am standing at ground zero I think it's 2004, there's still a big hole in the ground behind me. And, um, you know, uh, there are a number of people alive today, of course, and weren't alive at 9-11, 2001. Um, but I was, I was in prison, locked up when that happened. And I got the call and they said, you need to go to the warden's suite. Something terrible is happening. And I went to the warden's suite, and there it was on the TV, and I watched it live in real time. And um, the reason that happened, of course, was because of a theocracy in Afghanistan, a theocratic regime that harbored al-Qaeda and its terrorist network there under the theocrats of and here's an old picture, they would have regular large gatherings where they would have public executions. And, um, and this is what, what was happening there in this picture. And public corporal punishment and so on um, in this theocracy. And we, of course, as Adventists know, how dangerous a theocracy can be and will be at the close of time. Scripture is very clear about that. And uh, it, yes, it was a theocracy that really led, ultimately, was the embryonic um, initial breeding ground that led to 9-11. I don't know if you ever heard Jose Rojas speak, speak, Rojas speak about his experience on 9-11. Little side detour, anecdote here. But um, quite riveting. He was scheduled to speak in a meeting at the top of the World Trade Center that day, that morning. He was, in, he was part of the pre President's Council on international youth. He was appointed to be part of that council. He was scheduled to be at the top of that building, would not be alive today, but for a curious circumstance. 
as he was preparing to go, as he may have actually been on his way, his wife called him on his phone. And she said, dear, you've forgotten. Our wife, I mean, not our, wife, our, our daughter has a recital this morning. And he had to make a split second decision. And apparently it didn't take him too awfully long because he actually decided against all odds to call the president of the United States office and inform them that he could not be at the meeting because his daughter had a recital. Imagine that. He made the right choice. Imagine that. And there's an admonition for all of us to make the right choice regarding our families and the family of God, which should take prior a priority. We live in a society filled with moral outrage and threats of violence. Psychological studies show that this outrage is often nothing more than an effort to appear morally worthy and to hide one's own culpability by demonizing the other. And so the old adage, the three fingers are pointing back <laughs> at you when you point the finger. And of course, uh, we have the internet, and the internet, the anonymity now makes it all easier even to do this kind of behavior where you demonize the other and glorify yourself through your demonizing them. Well, uh, maybe we could just get back to the American dream, huh? Maybe that would bring peace to us, you think? <laughs> the old American dream. Well, the 50s weren't quite all they were cracked up to be. <laughs> we tend to idolize them. But yes, if, if, if you could just have the two-car garage and the nice house and the car and all this other stuff and, and the, the, the two kids and so on, or one and a half kids or whatever it is. And, uh, but uh, when, when you look at those who have seemed to have achieved the American dream, their lives are not very peaceful. You look at the tabloids and common folk like the tabloids. That's because they look and they say, well, maybe my life is not so bad after all. Even the rich and famous have no peace. And, but true peace can only come through Jesus once again. That's the refrain of this sermon. At his very birth, it was declared there would be peace, even because of his, just because of his birth into this world. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus once again said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, you see. Peace True peace is a gift given by Jesus Christ. That's where true peace is found, and it's made possible by the cross. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Romans chapter 5, since we have been justified by faith through the blood of the cross, I should add, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God first, leading to peace with our fellow man. Peace with God first and primarily, and this leads to peace with our fellow man. And if, uh, if we have accepted the peace made possible through Jesus, then our feet will be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Think about that. The gospel is a gospel of peace. We are ambassadors, we are told, on behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating by us. What, what are we entreating? We are entreating the world to be at peace with God through Jesus. We beseech you on behalf of Christ, be ye reconciled to God. Peace, 
peace in our families, peace in society, peace in the world. Yes, even peace in the prisons that I've worked at. Yes, believe it or not, even peace in the church, often racked with conflict. Even peace in the most hateful places. Perhaps you're familiar with the story of the peace child. Yes. Um, Don Richardson, who labored with one of the most demonic people imaginable. The Sowie cannibals of Erin Jaya. When he first read them the gospel account, when he got to the story of Judas... The tribesmen all cheered. They all cheered. They cheered Judas because that was the pinnacle of human achievement for a male Sowie, was to groom a man uh, who was not of the tribe but a neighboring tribe, somehow maybe somebody not totally of the tribe, to befriend them, groom them for maybe even years as a bosom buddy until the chosen moment when they would stare them in their eyes and take their life and then consume their flesh. And so it wasn't until, of course, they were ready to leave, the Richardsons, until they found out that the Sowie and other tribes had this means of making peace between tribes through the offering of this child from the tribe to the other tribe, the peace child. Of course, this was the redemptive analogy that was used to share the gospel of how the peace child Jesus was shared with the human race, brought reconciliation and peace. And of course, uh, as a result, there was a great revival that was brought out. The largest uh, indigenous structure ever built on earth, so we think, <laughs> to house this revival. There's Don Richardson in the middle of it. And um, the Sowie were led to be at peace with God. I think of the so-called Aka or Hurani of Ecuador, the famous Aka martyrs from back in 1956. Five men, we just have four of them portrayed here, decided to reach the most unreachable of the South American tribes. The tribesmen being notorious for holding off conquistadors and rubber barons and timber barons and you name it, nobody wanted to mess with them. And they decided to try to bring the gospel to them. And Nate Saint, who was the pilot, very cleverly was able to circle his plane such that they could dangle some material down there in a package for the tribesmen to go through and see and so on. They were able to land on this sandbar and eventually they made contact. And they were all murdered, all five of them. Men who had abandoned their careers and their school and everything else, had promising lives, threw it all away and died there on a sandbar in Ecuador. And uh, many people don't know this, they were all stabbed, I mean they were all speared to death they actually had a rifle in their possession which they did not use. They laid down their lives for the cause of the gospel. Rachel Saint, Nate's sister, and Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, two and a half years later, Elizabeth, by the way, when her husband Jim died, had a 10-month-old baby. Two and a half years later, Rachel and Elizabeth would actually share the gospel with Hurani Oka tribesmen who had actually killed their loved ones and led them to Christ. Not as the world gives do I give you this peace. 
We are not to compromise with the prince of this world. Not as the world gives, no. We're not to compromise with the world to achieve peace because this compromise would only lead to a compromise with the prince of this world, the great murderer and the father of it. I'm reminded of the famous Neville Chamberlain who capitulated with Hitler in 37 and 39. There he is shaking hands with the infamous one. And uh, Churchill famously said, England has been offered a choice between war and shame, and she has chosen shame, and we'll get war. There is only shame involved with capitulating or compromising with the world and the prince of this world. This was basically the temptation that was brought to Jesus, who was shown all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil tried to get him to take the shortcut. Take the shortcut. You can bypass the cross, Jesus. Uh, we'll just give you the entire world as long as you just bow and worship me and compromise with me. And of course, Jesus said, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, or whatever he said. He said, uh, it is written, of course. <laughs> and that was the end of it. The devil and the world hate the gospel of peace. Above all, the devil does not want man at peace with God through the gospel. He will do everything to prevent that. In Matthew 5, we read this. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. If you surrender to Jesus and the gospel, there can be no compromise with sin or the author of sin. No capitulation. As a result, there will be spiritual warfare. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is where the warfare is. This is the heart of it right here. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Finally, from Matthew 10, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, he said, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law person's enemies will be those of his own household. I experienced this for a while with my brother when I first went Christward. He went and was fellowshipping with witches and warlocks in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, fortunately, we're on speaking terms at this moment, but uh, it, it was pretty bad then. I was in a terrible construction accident, lying in a hospital bed for several weeks, and he sent me a poison pen letter, virtually wishing me dead. MLK, yes, we must use soul force, the terminology that he coined. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. Soul force is what we are to use. And he took his inspiration from the work of Gandhi. Here we have the Darasana salt works, where the passive, unresisting men were methodically beaten to a bloody pulp that day in 1930, 320 or more injured with fractured skulls. 
turn the tide in the history of India toward uh, independence, result of this nonviolent resistance. You know, we have, uh, we have a heroic moment in our history, don't we, when it comes to this warfare? And uh, you may know what I'm talking about. I don't know. If you look closely, you'll see a woman and a small child walking there next to that um, barrier there on the right. This is actually the Maida escarpment. That's my wife and granddaughter there. I had the opportunity to go there to the Maida escarpment. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't that very long ago that the top of that ridge, otherwise known as Hacksaw Ridge, was laced with mortar fire and heavy artillery fire and machine gun fire and small arms fire. And Desmond Doss saved 75 men and dropped them down right there over that cliffside where I took this picture. Just incredible hero of the faith in the midst of the great controversy. And um, as a result, he became a great hero of not just our faith, but of Christianity still revered, and um, I think of the conflict between a man named Zwingli, early church reformer in Switzerland, and Martin Luther. Luther had a temper. He plainly admitted it, and he was not very kind to those he saw opposed to his agenda and so on. But they had a debate together, a public debate, Zwingli and Luther, and they agreed on most terms, but they split on some others, and Luther left in a great vehement huff of sorts. And later, Zwingli would be sitting in his study, and he looked out, and he saw some mountain goats on a, on a steep precipice where only one of them could pass, and they were both headed towards each other. And he was overwhelmed with this, this conflict, and he saw it as exemplifying the conflict between him and Luther. And then he saw the one, the one mountain goat all of a sudden just kneel down on its knees. And the other goat went over it and went by. And he thought, this is God calling me to take the stance of humility in my conflict with Luther. And so it should be with us. You know, that's how Christ, more often than not, is victorious. When we suffer a wrong, rather than cry out for vengeance in the injustice. Well, you may remember this, the peace accord, Yasser Arafat, uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, Rabin made this statement. He said, you don't make peace with friends, you make it with very unsavory enemies. And that's what we're called to do as peacemakers, not just be nice to the people we like in the pew next to us. No, to reach out to those whom <coughs> may even be our enemies. Don't worry, we're almost done with this. You feel better at ease now? Those of you that are still awake? Uh, for seven years, I, uh, twice a year, was engaged in a thing called the Kairos Prison Ministry. And with the Kairos Prison Ministry, they have an intensive weekend where they, they bombard men with unconditional love and regard, and people all over the world are praying for that particular event and for those men that are in that event, and, and they're presenting to them the principles of Christian discipleship and the like. And early on in the efforts, well, actually, every offender and inmate in the entire facility and every staff member would receive not just one, but two dozen cookies. And in many of the prisons I worked at were either 2,500 inmates or in excess maybe 2,700 inmates. Multiply that with several hundred staff members, and you get an idea of how many cookies 
those wives had to make it back there. <laughs> I guess men were helping too. A lot of cookies. Anyway, early in the effort, they would inform the men that are sitting there, okay, this is your job. You're supposed to take this dozen cookies tonight. Take it back to the block, back to the dorm, back to your cell area. And uh, by the time you return tomorrow, you are to take this dozen cookies and hand it to your worst enemy. And immediately some men would say, no, I ain't doing that. And, uh, and then eventually they would acquiesce because others would say, well, maybe that's a good idea. I don't know. I don't know if I can even do it. Some of them would just go like this. They'd say, they'd just walk up to the guy and say, hey, look, they told me to do this. And they'd hand him a cookie and that was it. Others would actually seek to make reconciliation. There would be a powerful story, testimony they'd bring to the meeting next day of how there'd be reconciliation even in the midst of that and so on. And uh, a lesson for us. Romans 12. Got a few more Bible texts here. Please forgive me for throwing so many texts at you. I don't usually put this many in a message. But here we go. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be concerned for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, on your part, live at peace with all. If possible. Beloved, do not look for revenge, but leave room for wrath. For this, it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will keep burning coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. When a man's ways pre please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. It says in Proverbs. Matthew 5, once again. You have heard it said, love your enemies and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. First Thessalonians, be at peace among yourselves, admonish the disorderly, encourage the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient toward all, see that no one returns evil for evil, follow after that which is good. Be a at peace among yourselves. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how. Not necessarily how vigorously you preached the Mark of the Beast message at the evangelistic effort. But that your congregation loves one another with the love that Jesus loved them with. The Prince of Peace, Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the great peacemaker. Why? Because he hung on a Roman war cross dedicated to the Roman war god. died in an act of cruel violence to make peace possible, not by bombing the heck out of his enemies, but by taking the full force of every weapon forged in Hades upon himself. Peace costs something. It costs Jesus everything. And yes, I'm sorry to inform you, but true peace might cost you and I something too. Yes, it might cost us our pride. Yes. Some people might say, well, I can love my enemy, I, say, I suppose. I can do some nice deeds for him, but to love a brother or sister in the church who they've been injured by? Oh, no, 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 no. Think, uh, no, no, I'm not sure about that, no. Yes, it may even cost us our lives, but it is worth it. It is the only way to peace. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. Let's sing our closing hymn. <laughs>
Let us pray. Lord, we, we've looked at some, some uh, very startling things, I suppose. Yes, it's a startling thing to live on planet Earth. We're kind of hermetically sealed off from a lot of the pain and suffering in this world here in this affluent bubble we live in, we call the United States. In our affluent conclaves, but uh, wars are raging all over the world as we speak. And the conflict between Christ and Satan has not been brought to its final end as yet. And the war is still raging even in our own hearts and minds at times. And even in the household of faith. And we just pray that the Prince of Peace would prevail in each one of our souls and that you would use us as your ambassadors of peace yes even bringing love to our enemies and yes even bringing the love that you loved us with to those in the church and in our families and we just pray all of this in the Prince of Peace's name Jesus. Amen. 